Schmendrick paid no attention. Where's the wine? he demanded of Molly. Let me see what I can do with the wine. I couldn't find any, she said nervously. I looked everywhere, but I don't think there's a drop in the castle. The magician glared at her in vast silence. Well, I looked, she said. Schmendrick raised both arms slowly and then let them fall to his sides. Well, he said, well, that's it then. If we can't find the wine, I have my illusions, but I can't make wine out of air. The skull giggled in a clacking, talking sort of way. Matter can neither be created nor destroyed, it remarked. Not by most magicians, anyways. From a fold of her dress, Molly produced a small flask that gleamed faintly in the darkness. She said, I thought if you had some water to start with. Schmendrick and the skull gave her very much the same look. Well, it's been done, she said loudly. It's not as though you'd have to make something new. I'd never ask that of you. Hearing herself, she looked sideways at the Lady Amalthea, but Schmendrick took the flask from her hand and studied it thoughtfully, turning it over and murmuring, murmuring curiously, fragile words to himself. Finally, he said, well, why not? As you say, it's a standard trick. There was quite a vogue for it at one time. I remember, but it's really a bit dated these days. He moved one hand slowly over the flask, weaving a word into the air. What are you doing? The skull asked either eagerly. Hey, do it closer. Do it over here. I can't see anything. The magician turned away, holding the flask to his breast and bowing over it. He began a whispery chant that made Molly think of the sounds that a dead fire continues to make long after the last coal has faded. "'You understand,' he said, interrupting himself. "'It won't be anything special, vin ordinaire, if that.' Molly nodded solemnly. Schmendrick said, "'And it's usually too sweet, and how am I supposed to get it to drink itself? I haven't the faintest idea.' He took up the incantation again even more softly, while the skull complained bitterly that it couldn't see or hear anything. Molly said something quiet and hopeful to the Lady Amalthea, who neither looked at her nor replied. The chant stopped abruptly, and Schmendrick raised the flask to his lips. He sniffed it at first, muttering, Weak, weak, hardly any bouquet at all, Nobody ever made good wine by magic. Then he tilted it to drink, then shook it, then stared at it, and then, with a horrible, small smile, turned it over. Nothing ran out. Nothing at all. That's done it, Schmendrick said almost cheerfully. He touched a dry tongue to his dry lips and repeated, That's done it. That's finally done it. Still smiling, he lifted the flask again to hurl it across the hall. No, wait, hey, don't do that! The skull's clattering voice protested so wildly that Schmendrick's halted, Schmendrick halted before the flask left his hand. He and Molly turned together to regard the skull, which, so great was its anguish, had actually begun to wriggle where it hung, cracking its weathered occupant hard against the pillar as if to strove itself free. Don't do that, it wailed. You people must be crazy throwing away wine like that. Give it, a, give it to me if you don't want it, but don't throw it away. It rocked and lurched on the pillar, whimpering. A dreamy, wondering look crossed Smendrick's face, rather like a rain cloud drifting over dry country. Slowly, he asked, and what use have you for wine with no tongue to taste it, no ribby palate to savor it, no gullet to gulp it down? Fifty years dead, can it be that you still remember, still desire? Fifty years dead, what else can I do? The skull had ceased its grotesque twitching, but frustration had made its voice almost human. I remember, it said, I remember more than wine. Give me a swallow, that's all. Give me a sip, and I'll taste it as you never will with all your runny flesh, all your buds and organs. I've had time to think. I know what wine is like. Give it to me. 
Schmendrick shook his head, grinning. He said, Eloquent, but I've been feeling a bit spiteful myself lately. For a third time, he lifted the empty flask, and the skull groaned in mortal misery. Out of pity, Molly Grew began to say, But isn't it? But the magician stepped on her foot. Of course, he mused aloud, if you should happen to remember the entrance to the Red Bull's cavern, as well as you remember wine, we might have a bargain yet. He twiddled the flask casually between two fingers. Done, the skull cried instantly. Done for a dram, but give it to me now. I'm more thirsty with thinking of wine than I ever was in life when I had a throat to be dry. Only give me a single swig now and I'll tell you anything you want to know. The rusted jaws were beginning to grind sideways on each other. The skull's slaty teeth were trembling and spitting. Give it to him, Molly whispered to Schmendrick. She was terrified that the naked eye sockets might start to fill up with tears, but Schmendrick shook his head again. I will give it all to you, he said to the skull, after you tell us how we may find the bull. The skull sighed but never hesitated. The way is through the clock, it said. You simply walk through the clock, and there you are. Now can I have the wine? Through the clock? The magician turned to peer into a far corner of the great hall, where the clock stood. It was tall and black and thin, the sundown shadow of a clock. The glass over its face was broken, and the hour hand was gone. Behind gray glass, the works could barely be seen, twitching and turning as fretfully as fish. Schmendrick said, You mean, when the clock strikes the right time it opens, and then there's a tunnel, a hidden stair? His voice was doubtful, for the clock seemed far too lean to conceal any such passageway. Oh, I don't know about that, the skull replied. If you wait for this clock to strike the hour, you'll be here until you're as bald as I am. Why complicate a simple little secret? You walk through the clock, and the red bull is on the other side. Now gimme. But the cat said, Schmendrick began. Then he turned and walked towards the clock. The darkness made him seem to be going down over a hill, growing small and stooped. When he reached the clock, he kept walking without pause, as though it were truly no more than a shadow but he bumped his nose. This is stupid, he said coldly to the skull as he returned. How do you think to cheat us? The way to the bull may well lead through the clock, but there's something more to know. Tell me, or I will spill the wine out on the floor for you to remember the smell of much, and look of as much as you choose. Be quick. The skull was laughing again, this time making a thoughtful, almost kindly noise. Remember what I told you about time, it said? When I was alive, I believe, as you do, that time was at least as real and solid as myself, and probably more so. I said, one o'clock, as though I could see it, and Monday, as though I could find it on the map, and I let myself be hurried along from minute to minute, day to day, year to year, as though I was actually moving from one place to another. Like everyone else, I lived in a house bricked up with seconds and minutes, weekends and New Year's days, and I never went outside until I died because there was no other door. Now I know that I could have walked through the walls. Molly blinked bewilderedly, but Schmendrick was nodding. Yes, he said, that's how the real magicians do it, but then the clock, the clock will never strike the right time the skull said. Haggard scrambled the works a long time ago, one day when he was trying to grab hold of time as it swung by. But the important thing is for you to understand that it doesn't matter whether the clock strikes ten next, or seven, or fifteen o'clock. You can strike your own time and start the count anywheres. When you understand that, then any time at all will be the right time for you. At that moment, the clock struck four. The last bang had not yet faded when there came an answering sound from beneath the great hall. Neither a bellow 
nor the savage grumble that the Red Bull often made when he dreamed. It was a low, inquiring sound, as though the bull had awakened, sensing something new in the night. Every flagstone buzzed like a snake, and the darkness itself seemed to shudder as the glowing night creatures scampered wildly to the edges of the hall. Molly knew suddenly and surely that King Haggard must be near. "'Give me the wine,' the skull said. "'I have kept my end of the bargain.' Silently, Schmendrick tipped the empty flask to the empty mouth, and the skull gurgled and sighed and smacked. Oh, it said at last, oh, that was the real stuff. That was wine. You're more of a magician than I took you for. Do you understand me now about time? Yes, Schmendrick answered. I think so. The red bull made his curious sound again, and the skull rattled against the pillar. Schmendrick said, No, I don't know. Is there no other way? How can there be? Molly heard footsteps, then nothing, then the thib, thin, cautious ebb and flow like breathing. She could not tell where it came from. Schmendrick turned to her, and his face seemed to be smudged from within, like the inside of a lantern glass, with fear and confusion. There was a light, too, but it shook like a lantern in a storm. I think I understand, he said, but I'm sure I don't. I'll try. I still think it's a real clock, Molly said. That's all right, though. I can walk through a real clock. She p spoke partly to comfort him, but she felt a brightness in her own body as she realized that what she said was true. I know where we have to go, she said, and that's as good as knowing the time any day. The skull interrupted her. It said, I'll give you a bit of advice in the bargain, because the wine was so good. Schmendrick looked guilty. The skull said, smash me. Just knock me on the floor and let me break into pieces. Don't ask why, just do it. It was speaking very quickly, almost whispering. Together, Schmendrick and Molly said, What? Why? The skull repeated its request, and Schmendrick demanded, What are you saying? Why on earth should we break you? Do it, the skull insisted. Do it! The sound of breath came nearer from all directions, though only one pair of feet. No, Schmendrick said, You're crazy. He turned his back and started a second time towards the gaunt, dark clock. Molly took the Lady Amalthea by her cold hand and followed him, trailing the white girl like a kite.